Good morning, everyone. So my name's Ian Lloyd. I mostly go by Lloydy uh, on the various socials. According to Pixel Pioneers, I look like this. This is a picture that I hastily ran outside to take to send to Oliver. Um, and I kind of wish I didn't because... Um, audio. Um, the Adidas stripe to my arms reflecting in my glasses make, make it look like I have either laser beam eyes or some freaky eyelashes, but it could be worse. <coughs> Okay, this is interesting. Already gone wrong, but there was always going to be something that went wrong. Okay, let's try this again. There we go. On Twitter, as Lloydy, I look like this. I do like a good gurn, and this is one of my finest achievements. Funnily though, someone I met at a conference last year only knew what I looked like from my Twitter profile, and she was generally having trouble tracking me down. She was looking for someone who was the human equivalent of Jabba the Hutt. Um, on GitHub, also as Lloydy, I'm like this. Beardy, cross-eyed, and based on the lights behind me, having some kind of eureka moment. And on Mastodon, I'm like this, whatever that cuddly toy thing is that's working at set of DJ decks. Actually, it's not a bad metaphor, as I can be rather sloth-like, and I do like to think that I'm a DJ. Clearly, I am not one for consistent branding. Now, before we get started, just a quick note to say that if you want to download the slides, a version of it is available at this address. That's a11y-tools.com slash presentations slash uppercase PP24. Or you can put your camera at this QR code. I will be showing the QR code again at the end of the presentation, so don't panic if you miss it now. Okay, so when I was putting this presentation together, I noticed at that time that I was after Amy Heap in the running order. And at this point in the presentation, I was about to say, that was a great presentation there from Amy, as always, and that when I realised that I was going to speak right after her, my original thoughts went something like this. Shit on it! Shit on it. This is a shitting nightmare! Oh, shit and shit! Um, because she's a hard act to follow, and maybe that's why Oliver moved her to slot to the end of the day. But, unfortunately, I didn't spot this until just yesterday, and, well, look, I just didn't want to drop these clips because they're silly and I'm very immature. So the following video should now be treated as my reaction to realising the running order has changed, but my slides have not. Shit on it! 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 Shit! Where's my shit in the floor? So this is me, Ian Lloyd, aka Lloydy, and I'm a principal accessibility engineer at TPGI, which essentially means I get paid to tell developers all the ways they have messed up with regards to accessibility. I'm basically an auditor. I used to be what they call an auditor. The last guy anyone wants to see at their door. Okay, so auditing is nothing like that. Now, I'm much more likely to bore you to death with lengthy conformance reports than smash your head in with a baseball bat. Although, on some audits, the bat option is quite tempting. Before I specialised in accessibility, I was a web developer, going back 25 years-ish. So I get where a lot of you have come from, or are presently. Um, but I'll freely admit that my front-end skills have stagnated in recent years. Um, I'm here to learn just as much as I hope to educate. Uh, I've been a specialist in accessibility for five years, where it's been my full-time role. But I have been nagging developers about this topic for all of the 20 years before that. Um, today I'll be talking about mistakes that I see often while auditing, and many of them are well intended, but actually, uh, are actually harmful. Um, I'll try to provide some course correction and to steer you away from some bad habits. There will be video and audio in this talk, and all of the video will have captions. I'll also be describing images shown on screen so no one gets left out. It's important that we do this, and if you remain unconvinced, take it from this man. A few months ago I had the privilege of meeting... <coughs> What? Stevie Wonder at a conference in LA. Now, despite what it looks like in this selfie of me and Stevie, I am not wearing an apron, and this was not a cookery convention. He thanked me for all the work I did in accessibility and said it transforms lives. Okay, he didn't say directly to me. It was a group of maybe 200 people. But I was in the group, so still counts, right? Anyway, let's get this started. I'm going to start unconventionally by showing you a sausage. Here it is. If you recognise the cartoon sausage here that has just appeared on screen, don't shout it out. But if you do recognise this sausage, please put your hands up. Yeah, I thought there might be a few. Okay, but this is all terribly sightest of me, isn't it? Perhaps not everyone can see the sausage, so here's a clue for those not currently enjoying the view. Oh, that sounds a bit rough. Sounding familiar? That's Chicken Man by legendary library musician Alan Hawkshaw. 
case you're not aware of library music, this is music performed by session musicians that broadcasters could use for TV shows. Think of it like the audio equivalent of stock photography. And the TV show that it was used on was Grange Hill. And that sausage is, of course, the one that flies into view on the opening credits. Oddly, a version of Chicken Man was used briefly on the TV quiz show. Give us a clue. But I'm not here to talk about music. Why the heck am I referencing a TV show from 40 years ago? There's something that stuck in my head from those days, and it revolves around this girl and this guy. Janet Sinclair and Roland Browning. For the old farts in the audience, and I know that some hands went up, what catchphrase comes to mind? Anyone? I'll help you, Roland. I'm trying to help you, Roland. I'm yes, trying absolutely. to help you, Roland. So Janet Sinclair appointed herself as Roland Browning's friend, counsellor and advisor, but ultimately became a total annoyance and a frustrating presence for Roland. And some of the help that developers provide to enhance accessibility can land in similar fashion with assistive technology users. But after this session, I hope to have pointed out some of these bad habits. In the image showing on screen, Janet is saying, but I just want to help you, Roland. And he's looking away, responding with, leave me alone. Don't be like Janet. OK, so I've undertaken many web accessibility audit in my time, and I've seen a few sites, it's true to say. This normally means inaccessible sites, such as no keyboard support, terrible contrast, no alternative text, the usual suspects. I also see a lot of examples where developers have had a go. And by that, I mean they've clearly picked up an idea or two about accessibility along the way and have shown some enthusiasm to make things right. But as the saying goes, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Some of the mistakes I see are down to misunderstanding of when it's appropriate to take a certain approach. Because context is everything. And sometimes it's misunderstanding about how assistive technology users navigate and access site content. What I'll be doing here is running through some typical examples of over-enthusiastic over but slightly misguided attempts at making the site more accessible. I absolutely do not want to discourage anyone, any developer from making things more accessible, but there is definitely a need to do some course correction here and there. Given the Grange Hill reference, one might say that some of these are schoolboy errors. Okay, I'm gonna be covering issues that fall into these following three topics. So naming and shaming, how you can accidentally go overboard with naming elements. Picture imperfect, common mistakes people make with alternative text or images. What the focus, understanding how AT users navigate a page and how it doesn't mean making everything focusable. Now I've just said AT users, some people might not know what that means, so here's a, just a little bit of uh, jargon uh, busting. AT, assistive technology, think screen readers. WCAG means Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. These are the accessibility guidelines by which websites are judged and deemed conformant or not. And SC is Success Criterion. Each conformance issue that is found during a site audit is filed against one or possibly more WCAG SCs. For example, images missing alternative text would be 1.1.1 failures. Low contrast text would be 1.4.3. Keyboard issues will be 2.1.1, and so on. <laughs> As SpongeBob has just demonstrated, filing issues like this is fun. Shall we dive in? OK, we'll get on with the first part of the three topics, naming and shaming. And we begin with problems caused by overriding accessible names. Let's start with a simple logout link. Here's a perfectly good one right here. It uses the correct markup, has a nice, clear, accessible name of logout. So what could you do to break this? This is the kind of thing I see a lot. The logout link has been given an ARIA label of my account. The intention here was to provide additional information that this link will log you out of your account. I mean. Not that it's really needed or helpful, mind. I mean, what else would you be logging out of? The problem is that ARIA label is not providing additional information. In fact, that ARIA label overrides the default accessible name of logout. Why is this a problem? Well, let's demonstrate that with a couple of videos. First of all, we'll put ourselves, put ourselves in the shoes of a blind screen reader user. In fact, I'm going to hide the UI completely for this one to give you more of the effect. Visited link, my account. You are currently on a link. To click this link, press control, option, space. Main, heading level one. You are now signed out. I'm sure that's what you really wanted, right? Just... 
Okay, so we heard a control announced as my account. We tried to activate that and then found ourselves kicked out of the application. Not exactly helpful. Now let's try that again, this time with the UI showing. We'll try to experience it from the point of view of a sighted user who has mobility issues, which means they cannot use a mouse or keyboard to navigate. For this example, we'll be using dictation. How do you activate a control? As the saying went in catchphrase, you've got to say what you see. So here's our user Jeff who's quadriplegic and can neither use a mouse or keyboard and he uses voice commands. In the video that follows, note that Jeff can see logout but it's not possible to activate that control by saying what he sees because that pesky ARIA label of my account has meant that the computer doesn't know about any control named logout. So it only logged out when it heard the phrase my account. Tap logout. Tap logout. Hmm. Show names. Tap my account. Strange, Jeff sounds suspiciously like me, doesn't he? So this is what the computer thinks is going on here. In the accessibility pane in DevTools, we can see that the original accessible name logout, which is provided by the link elements contents, is crossed out and the act name now stands, now, Act name, access, accessible name, sorry, jargon I didn't tell you about earlier, um, now comes from the ARIA label. If the thing that you can see is named something entirely different from what the, the, the uh, computer understands it as, you have failed success criterion 2.5.3 label in name. Poor Jeff, he just can't log out still. It could be worse. He could be Dave. He's having a very bad day. Not you, Dave. <laughs> A different Dave. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? Well, clearly Hal is talking about a flagrant failure of success criteria in 2.5.3 label in name, as this highly scientific annotated photo explains. Dave is trying to open the pod bay doors, but Hal apparently has an act, these have apparently have an accessible name of Space Hatch. And Hal is all like, don't know what you're on about, mate. I call these Miss Space Hatches. You know, you've got to use the right terminology, man, because that's how Hal talked, of course. So don't override your controls, accessible names with helpful extra information. But I'd like to help you, my aunt. Well, you can't. That's not entirely true. You, if you really wanted to add extra information, you can by putting that in the, the ARIA label, but it must include the visible text in it. So with an ARIA label of log out of my account, you provide that extra information, but don't cause issues for assistive technology users. Well, apart from making it a little bit more verbose than it needs to be. So let's look at some verbosity problems. Now we're looking at a couple of links contained in a list. The accessible names of these links are fine as they are. They're perfectly fine. Visited link, log out, list two items. Link. Profile. You are currently on a link. But sometimes people feel the need to add lots of extra information in there, which is not always necessary. Now we have extra content provided with the RE label attributes. The RE label content is log out of my account, update your profile, email, picture, address, and more. Visited. Link. Log out of my account. List two items. Link. Update your profile, email, picture, address, and more. This time, there is no 2.5.3 label in name failure, as the visible text is in the accessible name that the RE label provides. But it's very wordy. You might think that this is helping, but many screen reader users might disagree. You're putting up some more hurdles. It takes longer to listen to the links if you're tabbing through. And if the screen reader user is bringing up a list of links on the page, as they often do, that list is going to be unnecessarily verbose too. Just wanted to help. One option is to decouple that supposedly helpful text. In the example I'm showing on screen now, I have used a title attribute to provide additional context. This text would appear over the element if you were to hover over it, but it will also provide an accessible description. The accessible name, which is what a screen reader user will perceive when tabbing through or bringing up a list of links, remains brief and to the point. If we check that in DevTools, we can see that the accessible name is profile and the description is update your email, picture, address, and more. In the next video, Note the slight gap between the announcement of the link's accessible name and the additional help text. List two items. One of two. Visited. Link. Log out. Log out immediately.
You are currently on a link. To click to link. Profile. Update your email. Picture. Address and more. You. So the, the slight pause there just means if you were tabbing through, you don't actually have the all that extra information coming to you all at one go. If you hang around, then it's going to going to be available to you. Now, one thing to point out. I have used the title attribute here, but you should note that title is pretty shite, generally. It's not available to a whole range of users. For example, a keyboard-only user tabbing to that control won't get that information as a tooltip. So, why did I provide an example using it? Mainly to be a bit of a dick about it, because frankly, I would just rather go back to the simpler version. It's not really providing any, anything particularly useful with that extra text. If you really want users to get that additional help, do so in a way that all users can perceive. Here's a more robust way. We put the extra help text on the page, which gets shown as a tooltip when the link element is hovered or receives focus. And the area described by attribute in the link references the text node, thus providing an accessible description for the link. <sighs> Click here means deep joy. Now let's go back to our two link examples again. Remind ourselves what two perfectly simple links look like. Now. What do you do with links? Yeah, so I think we've established that we can click it, right? That's just what you do with the links. Better tell the users that's what you have to do, otherwise they'll be stuck, right? No, they won't. It helps nobody to add that extra help. So please don't add click here to do whatever in ARIA label attributes. It's another example of unnecessary verbosity that will be felt most by screen reader users. Once again, the advice here is just not do the thing where you add the extra help. It's a link, people click them. Or maybe they don't. Bear in mind that not everyone will be clicking that link using a mouse. A screen reader user will be actually activating it with the enter key. And some users may be using physical switches, so it's even more reason not to use the click phrase. Okay, don't repeat yourself. Programming concepts as old as the hills. And in this section, I'm going to cover how this affects accessibility. Let's reset again and look at our two links. Ironically, in the slide titled Don't Repeat Yourself, I'm showing the same links as in previous slides. But now let's see what happens. Well, let's see what some people like doing by adding pointless ARIA label attributes that have the exact same text that is inside the element. Technically, there's nothing wrong with this. It's not inaccessible. It does not fail any WCAG SC. But there's definitely an optimization issue here. Why have the link text and then override it with an ARIA label with the exact, with the exact same text? It won't help your web performance if all your links and buttons are handled like this. But there is a bigger problem that may lie ahead. Just a moment. <clears throat> because this is the challenging part for me. Wenn ich die Webseite in Deutsche übersetzen würde, hätten wir möglicherweise ein Problem. Hopefully I got that right. <laughs> Depending on how that came out, yeah, uh, some people might be, what the hell was that? That was, my, that was German or my attempt at it, and they're not crying over there, so that's good. And um, what I actually said was, if I were to translate the web page into German, we may have a problem. What is the problem? Should you choose to translate the web page, you might find that the text on screen is correctly translated, but the text in the ARIA label is not. And now we find ourselves in a situation where we're failing success criterion 2.5.3 label in name again. Here is a demonstration of why this is a problem using voice control on Mac OS. Note that I cannot tap the else login link and I am only able to identify the link's actual name by saying the command show names. Click else login. Click else login. Show names. Click log out. Okay, so this is something that could occur if you translate web content on the fly, but it can also occur if your site has localization through some kind of token. That visible text is easy, main, easy to maintain because it's visible. Text is inside an ARIA label can easily be overlooked. I have seen this while auditing Thai and Chinese versions of a major tech brand's flagship products. All visible text was translated, but there would be occasional button or link names 
that were still set in English as they had overlooked tokenization of these phrases. Now, if this sort of thing happens due to not tokenizing these ARIA labels correctly, you've also accidentally failed success criteria in 3.1.2 language of parts. Although the change in language not being indicated, the failure that I'm talking about here, is not really the part you want to fix. It's a cascading failure. It's a knock-on effect from the other issue. So it's just good housekeeping. Don't repeat yourself with ARIA label attributes. There's Janet shrugging. She doesn't want to hear it. Now for the second of our three sections, we'll be covering images. If you drop an image onto a page, you should describe it for the benefit of non-sighted users, right? So this seems fine, does it? Alt equals dog. And the alt text is not really telling us much, is it? How about this instead? The alternative text provided now is a Cairn Terrier lying down on a beach, looking up and expectantly waiting for another stone to be thrown into the sea for her to retrieve. That's more like it. It's not too verbose. It conveys just enough information to provide an equivalent experience for blind users. The problem is that sometimes people take the same approach with all images. Let's take an example of a button that has an arrow in it. That's some kind of indicator that it'll take you somewhere. And the markup for this is very simple. It's just a native HTML button element with the phrase apply now inside, including an emoji arrow character. The button has been styled with CSS, and you should note that the emoji character renders differently in the browser from how it looks in the plain text editor. But how does it sound? Apply now right pointing arrow, button. I mean, it's not terrible, but it is a little clumsy and verbose for screen reader users. As I noted before, the accessible name is in most cases simply the inner text content. In this example, the symbol comes with its own descriptive text, um, as all emojis do, and that is exposed on the button name. Now you could, for example, not use an emoji character, that was just my big shortcut to, to achieve the effect. Um, and that has the, um, th and that's a good thing as well because emoji characters do have some unpredictability about how they may be rendered, as I showed in the previous slide, um, across different platforms. So you could use an image instead and provide your own accessible name using the alt attribute. But please, for the love of dog, do not do this. The image has an alt value of green arrow pointing to the right which then means that the button's accessible name will be apply now green arrow pointing to the right. Yuck. Now this is the classic case where having learned that images need to be described, the developer might apply that rule across the board. But is that the right approach here? No, 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 no. For an image used in this way, you really want it to be ignored completely by assistive technology. So just give it an empty alt attribute. This suppresses any rogue announcement, so a screen reader user will hear, apply now. Apply now, button. Is this better? Yes! 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 Here's another example of where we should avoid repetition. Because it's been drummed into developers that images need alternative text, sometimes people can get a little too carried away. In this section, I'm going to highlight a few examples of this. We'll start with what I'm going to call the Jimmy two times problem. You remember Jimmy from Grange Hill, yeah? Nah, he wasn't a Grange Hill character. You have to fast forward a few years to Goodfellas in 1990 for this reference. And Jimmy Two Times, who got that nickname because he said everything twice, like... I'm gonna go get the papers, get the papers. The situation crops up a lot when a link is wrapped around both an image and some real text, like this. And here's the markup for that example. So we have... Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, excuse me. Um, having had it jumped in so much that images must be described, we end up here. An, an image with an alt attribute that exactly matches the adjacent text, all wrapped in the link. Now you can imagine how annoying this is on pages where you have a series of thumbnails like this. And if you can't imagine, I'll try to help you here. The papers get the papers. The papers get the papers. The papers get the papers. In reality, it sounds more like this to a screen reader user. Link. Tesla Cybertruck spotted in Anaheim. California Tesla Cybertruck spotted in Anaheim, California. So while people might think that this is the correct thing to do, here's a clear example where you just want assistive technology to ignore the image. And doing so is simple. Just add an empty alt attribute, and this is all you need to stop it being exposed in the accessibility tree, thus hiding it from screen readers and other assistive tech. If it's an SVG or canvas element, you cannot use alt. That's only for image elements. Instead, use aria hidden equals true. Don't be like Jimmy two times. Don't be like Jimmy two times. 
when thinking about how images should be named, the key, question, the key question is, what are they being used for? Another example where you must provide descriptive text for all images can have a negative effect. Sometimes people can get a little too keen with the description, and in some cases, it's wholly inappropriate. Take this example of a logo. Here's one that comes to mind. Don't panic, Oliver. I'm not about to embarrass you. Now, if you were trying to explain how the logo looks, you might reasonably describe it, reasonably describe it as a light teal and red compass logo with the text Pixel Pioneers laid over it. The O in Pioneers forms the central pivot of the compass hands. Seems fair? At least if this were in the context of, say, an article where you were discussing logo design. In the markup showing, we can see that it's applied to the title element inside an SVG. If it were an image element, that would be applied to the alt attribute. But what if it's an image used as a link? Very typical usage. Now, does this alternative text still seem right? The problem now is that the alternative text is now providing the accessible name for that link. And what does that link do? It takes you to the Pixel Pioneers homepage. What would a screen reader user hear if it were done like this? Visited link image. A light teal and red compass logo with the text Pixel Pioneers laid over it. The O in Pioneers forms the central pivot of the compass hands. That's not going to help, is it? In this case, the image description is not really what we want. And just to reiterate, this is not what is happening on the Pixel Pioneers website. This is just an example of how not to do it. Given that the link phrase is really not saying what it will do, we'd, we, we've now failed this under success criteria and 2.4.4 link purpose in context. But depending on which day of the week and which auditor you ask, they may also decide to fail it on 1.1.1 non-text content and 2.4.6 headings and labels. The alternative text should instead indicate the purpose of the link that it is inside. This is how it's implemented on the Pixel Pioneers website. Although I would suggest a tiny refinement, I've just added the word home to the end to make it absolutely clear. You could, however, achieve both aims by providing the short accessible name that indicates where the link goes and also provide a description. As with the examples shown earlier, we can use ARIA described by for that. Note that in this markup, the descriptive text is only available to assistive technology users. The div it's contained in is set as hidden, and it will not render on screen. However, hidden elements may be referenced using ARIA described by, so it's a safe approach. Now, a screen reader user can get the quick link phrase, but depending on which screen reader they are using, they will either hear the description after a short pause, or they will be able to get the description if they choose it. In the following video, we can hear voiceover indicating that there is more content which the user can then listen to. Visited link, pixel pioneers, home, comma. You are currently on a link. To click this link, press control, option, space, press control, option, command, slash to bring up the more content menu. More content menu, one item. Description, a light teal and red compass logo with the text pixel pioneers laid over it. The O in pioneers forms the central pivot of the compass hands. So that's the best of both worlds. The description can be provided, but it's no longer haranguing the user. I'm worried about you, Roland. Leave me alone! Well, as you've just seen and heard, there are ways to avoid such annoyances. Okay, this is the last part of the images section where I explain why you don't need to tell people that an image is an image. If you're dropping an image into a page, please don't prefix it with, this is an image of whatever, because the thing is when you put an image into the document, it automatically exposes itself in the accessibility tree as, a, as an element with a role of image. So the image element is equivalent to manually adding a role equals image, I-M-A-G-E. Or is it? At this point, one or two of you might be wanting to yell out because there was an error in the, the example just shown there. Um, and the error was that actually it's not role equals I-M-A-G-E, it's I-M-G, just a little gotcha. But anyway, the point is if you drop in an image, it automatically exposes that role to the browser. Um, as the next video demonstrates, Image of a startled raccoon. Image. Image of a budgie fuddler in leopard print. Image. Image of a farty sketchy squirrel. Image. Image of. Image of. Image of a red sketchy squirrel. Image. You don't need to say this is an image. So all of that stuff at the beginning was kind of pointless because it's automatically provided. The only time I might suggest that you should add phrases like this is where it is truly rele relevant. So for example, if a blind person were looking to buy, say, a gift card for someone, they might want to know if the image in the gift card was a watercolor or a line drawing or a photo. So you could describe the kind of image. You do absolutely not need to say, this is an image. There's Janet, desperate to help again, being shut out. <laughs>
uh, help is just not needed here. For the third and final section, I'm going to cover issues related to keyboard focus. The image showing is a still from everything everywhere all at once, but it's now labeled everything focusable all at once, because that's another misconception that I come across more often than I'd like. It's the belief that for content to be accessible for screen reader users, everything needs to be focusable, because how else will a keyboard only user navigate around the page? Let's find out how wrong this is with a classic example of a table. Here we have a typical table of employee details. And here we have the first row of that table with tab index applied to every cell, every damn cell in every damn row. Let's see and hear how bad an idea this is. Entering table. Employee, table, six column, first name. Last name, you are currently on a cell, in department. 1001, software engineer, Jane. You sales representative, Emily, dot William, 1006, Robert. Davis. You support. You Ashley, dot Taylor, at company, dot com. Now, you are currently on a... <laughs> the speech rate on this was uh, set quite low for the presentation. Normally I have the speech rate set much higher. And if I had done that, you would have heard every cell announced uh, more frequently. So there's a bit, of a bit of a lag there. But the point is that to get from the beginning of the table, so there's a focusable element at the top and a focusable element at the end, to get from the top to bottom, it took me 61 tab key presses. That's the path taken. And you know, for keyboard only users, which the great majority of screen reader users are, this is the opposite of being helpful. Now, if I saw this, I'd be failing this under WCAG's success criterion 2.4.3, focus order. Although some might argue it's not a failure as the order is, cor order is correct, um, but it's, you're basically making non-interactive cells uh, focusable, and it's very, very disruptive for keyboard-only users. So what do we need to do? Well, basically, just remove the tab index. That's it. Simple. In the video I'm about to show, I am navigating up and down through the rows and left and right across columns using just the arrow keys. No tab index is required for screen reader users to be able to navigate this way. Table, six columns, 11 rows in table. No sir, first name, last name, job title, column four of six, row two of 11, software engineer, row three of 11, marketing manager, row four of 11, row five of 11, human, last, first, employee, first name, Emily, last name, Williams, job title, human resource. And if I wanted to, I could tab from the button that's currently focused at the top straight to the button at the end, one tab, that's all I need. So the same applies for headings, paragraphs, really any block of content that is non-interactive should not be focusable and tab index should not be applied. Now some of you may be thinking at this point, there are situations where you genuinely need to add a tab, tab index to a generic element. For example, you may be creating a custom select element because it's not possible to style the select element um, in CSS the, the way you want it to because of just browser defaults. Now, while it is always more preferable to use a native HTML element than to create your own custom one, there are sometimes cases where it's your only choice. If you're using native interactive elements such as a button, an input, or an anchor, A element, the element's role is automatically conveyed to assistive technology users. Remember the example of the image where we don't need to include image of in the alt text, the same sort of thing. Now, if you're creating something from a humble div or span element, just remember that you do need to specify the element's role. Because while you can visually style something that suggests a certain interaction, so you make something look like a button, a blind screen reader user won't get that cue. All they know is they have tabbed to a thing on the page, so presumably it does something. Providing a role will manage some users' expectations about what they can do with that thing. Another word of caution regarding focus issues. There are times when it's valid, and expected that the user's focus should be moved on their behalf. For example, opening a dialogue. Focus moves from the trigger to the dialogue or an interactive element inside. Form errors, um, when, you, when the user is moved back to a field that has been entered incorrectly upon submission. So valid ways that you do want to actually move the focus. Now sometimes though we see instances where focus is moved and it Seems like it might be useful, but it ends up causing more pain. Let's take another look at this employee database again. This time the table is simplified and only shows the employees' names and job titles. All the other information that was in the table previously is now shown in a panel to the side when it's needed, like this. Note that in the example here, it's just me using the mouse. I click a thing, it shows the details immediately on the right side of the screen. What's not obvious here, is that the focus is being moved to the heading on the right panel. 
You can't see that because I'm doing this using the mouse, so you don't see where the focus is. Now let's see the keyboard user's experience with the screen reader running. Look up employee 1001, John Doe, button. You are heading level 2, 1001, John Doe, details panel, region. Okay, well that seems okay, doesn't it? The focus has moved to the heading for this newly revealed content. The screen reader has read out the text that's been shown. But what if I wanted to check other employees' details? What if I wanted to check the second person in that table? Well. John Doe, details panel, region. You are currently on a heading level two. Entering employee details, look up employee 1009. Look up employee 1000 and look up employee 1000 and look up employee 1003. Michael Johnson, button. Heading level two, 1002, Jane Smith. D that was a lot of backtracking for a keyboard user. That was nine shift and tabs to get back to the next person in the table. And of course, just to note, this is a very short and very fictional table. So, another 2.4.3 failure. Or is it? Actually, no, it's not. The focus order is correct once you've moved to that right panel, and only interactive elements are focusable as you move back. But it's still a pretty shitty user experience for all keyboard users. The point here is that what you thought was helping might not be entirely welcomed. Why don't you show up? Browning! Rowling's getting really cheesed off with all this and just pushed Janet through a wall. All right, it's a prop from a school play made of paper, but clearly he's done with all of the help. So how might you approach a UI like this? Instead of moving focus, leave the user's focus on the button that they just clicked. For screen reader users, the display of that text can be handled by using live regions. When a live region is updated, the change of content will be announced. Here's a different version of that tool. Note that I am free to navigate through the buttons and display the text without then having to shift and tab back through multiple controls to get to where I came from. 1001, John Doe job title, software engineer department, IT email, John, dot Doe, at, company, dot com home address, 123 Main Saint, Springfield, Hill 60 2007, Look up employee 1002, look up employee 1003, look up employee 1004, Emily Williams, button, 1004, Emily Williams job title, human resources special, look up employee 1005, David Brown, button, 1005, David Brown job title, financial analyst department. Another option would be to treat that content on the right as a modal dialogue, whereby you can only get back to the main table content by closing that panel. That way the focus can be properly managed. Uh, and you move back to the control that you previously selected. There's no video mock-up for this. You know about dialogues, right? So, to summarize everything that I've just said then, anytime you're adding an ARIA, an attribute that starts with ARIA, question whether it's really needed. If it is needed, check that, what you've actually check that you've not actually caused issues for assistive tech users. Always favor native HTML over custom elements where you can. Shun the mouse, try to navigate what you build with keyboard only and work out whether you've helped or possibly hindered. If it's too complicated to make it accessible, maybe it's too complicated for everyone. Just to go back to point two, actually, I, I said, if you're using ARIA, test it with assistive tech. I would suggest you test, uh, do that as part of your routine testing, not just when adding ARIA. In short, whatever you do to help improve the accessibility of your web content and interfaces, be sure to test as much as you can to make sure that your help is not as welcome as Janet's constant interventions. What? No. Have you been listening to me or what? Go away where we are. Just leave me alone. Mind your own business, shut up, Holmes. Oh, shut up, you. Just shut up! No, go away! Why don't you shut up? So, that's all from me. If you have any questions about anything I've shown here, please feel free to ask me later. Just remember, I only want to help you, Bristol. Is that it? Yes. Right.